Well, Greg has been in Habakkuk, and uh, last week in, not last week, but yeah, last week, last couple weeks, he mentioned wrath, and he particularly mentioned in this last week, he mentioned uh, prophetic gaps, and he mentioned also things like the wrath of God. These are things that um, we hear a lot of information about, we get a lot of sermons about a lot of opinion about, and it creates a lot of confusion. And uh, so I thought what would be interesting to do would be to take a look at some of these and um, put them in um, what I believe is a proper context. Because, uh, you know, these days people are fearful. I get a lot of confusion from people. Sometimes some of the most common questions people ask, I mean, if you're watching what's going on in the world and all today, um, we know that all kinds of things are happening and some people are filled with a little bit of dread, some trepidation about uh, what is going on around them. Um, there are comments, everything from, um, you know, gee, I think we're at the, uh, you know, whatever, the fifth trumpet in Revelation now. Somebody said, no, we're at the third seal. And um, some people say there is no... You know, we're not, that stuff already happened in 70 AD. No, we're going to, we have to be raptured first. There is no rapture. That word is not in the Bible. So there's a lot of uh, opinion. There's a lot of bad information. So I thought I'd kind of go through some of this right now. Um, so some of that terminology was near and far fulfillment. And um, I saw a couple exchange looks, like I'm not sure I know what that means. And uh, some of these gaps in the midst of prophecy. So I want to clear some of that up so we understand. So when we hear some of these terms and people talk, we know what it is that, um, you know, what they're referring to. So um, the, the title of the sermon this morning is All These Things, and I'm going to use all these things because there are specific things that Jesus gave us in particular in the Olivet Discourse. And um, there's no way we're going to spend two or three hours here now and go through the entirety of Matthew 24 and 25. Obviously, uh, I am going to maybe open up the fire hose a little bit. So thank God for technology and for video so that you can go back. And if you miss any scripture references, uh, you didn't get to write it down, you can go back and view it later. And I encourage you to do that. Um, some of these passages, like particularly in the Old Testament, I'm going to read a series of passages, for instance, in the Minor Prophets. And unless you're a really good Bible driller, you might be spending more time turning pages than listening to what's going on. So I'll let you know when that happens. There's some passages I definitely, I want you to look at all of them maybe, you know, sometime at home or when you're interested in when this kind of thing interests you and you decide to sit down and do it, but not necessarily try to flip to all those passages right now. Um, so uh, all these things and more are things that we see this thing this morning and they're playing out in the end jesus spoke of these things all these things particularly in his olivet discourse it may surprise you to learn that jesus discourse upon the mount of olives is not a beginning to end chronology people will try to harmonize luke and try to harmonize matthew and it's not here's the beginning and here's the end it's not a end to end chronology in fact jesus mentions and then the end and then the end and then the coming of the Son of Man, in so many terms, he mentions the end over a dozen times in that passage. So unless there's 12 or more endings, um, that's not the case. So he's explaining different um, events and telling a little bit beforehand what's going to lead up to that. And then he goes, backs it up, and then he puts things in different contexts a little bit over time. So we're not going to cover all of that. So you can breathe now a sigh of relief. Um, but it's important because these things are important because as we read Second Peter 3, speaking of prophecy, um, it says, mockers will come. Where's the promise of his coming? We've heard this before. So ladies and gentlemen, the mockers are here, and most of these mockers are within the church. That's where you hear most of the mocking from. It's not unbelievers. They just mock everything in general about belief, but about in the end times and about the context in Second Peter 3, it's just generally mockers, and I'm finding most of them come from churches. So 
many of them today believe with their whole heart that all this end time stuff is all figurative language. But I want to caution you, if we're going to symbolize away one so-called unimportant segment of biblical theology, what prevents us from following the same bad hermeneutics and symbolizing away the cross of the resurrection? If this is going to be your hermeneutic, your way of interpreting scripture, your science of interpreting scripture, um, what is the rule for symbolizing, for deciding what the symbolism is and who gets to decide and what the meaning is? So um, th this stuff about the Old Testament is important and the New Testament um, pulls it all together and adds to it. We don't want to unhitch from the Old Testament. Those prophecies are still coming true today. Matthew 16, Jesus castigated the Jews for knowing how to predict the weather and yet not knowing how to read the signs of the times. He said, no one knows the day or the hour, yet he gave signs to watch for that we might know the times and the seasons. So that sounds a lot like Jesus thought it was important. In the Olivet Discourse, Jesus gave Peter, James, John, and Andrew a number of signs to observe concerning the end, and then commanded them, commanded them, watch therefore. It was an imperative. So one of my favorite passages, one of my favorite verses is Titus 2.13. Titus 2.11-15 to 15 gives us a good context for why is this important. Why should I care about the end? We get too wrapped up in all this end time stuff, and some people do. Um, some people say end time signs in, uh, you know, the presidential elections. You know, and we, we're talking, though, biblical. We want to try to keep it biblical, always. Titus 2 11 to 15 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, sell us for good works. Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority, let no one despise you. But, uh, possibly a better passage that addresses this is 1 John 3, verses 2 and 3. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. Amen, I'm ready for that. For we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So if we're anticipating the master coming, it prompts us, it reminds us to walk a holy walk. It was Oliver Wendell Holmes, a Unitarian and a mocker himself, who said, some people are so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. You might have heard that before. Well, I say... Today, in most churches, they're so earthly-minded that they're no heavenly good. We need to immerse ourselves in God's Word so that we're not like the Pharisees, but so that we can discern the signs of the times. We need to follow Christ's command to watch, therefore, why we do not wish to impose the news upon Scripture. We ought to pay attention to the times what's going on around us and discern them within that framework of scripture. So you have to read it and study it before we know, right? Some tell us that there are no end times per se. The world is going to get better and better and better until eventually it's going to become so good, so awesome down here that the Lord's going to come down here and decide to hang out with us. That's a post-millennial position. I don't think that's working out so well right now. <clears throat> Others mock, as I've said before, and say that there's no rapture. Else, others say that there is also no earthly kingdom. Or that the kingdom is already here, but it's in heaven. They say that Satan is bound now. The word thousand in Revelation doesn't mean what they say it means, but it means what they think it should mean. And oh, by the way, all that stuff in Revelation, it's figurative language for stuff that mostly happened back in the first century. I'm not going to get to address all that right now. 
You see me after. I don't recall ever reading in history about over half the world being destroyed. That's what happens in the book of Revelation. So I guess we have to call that metaphor too. All those numbers in there, symbolic. For what? Who knows? Who gets to decide? Who decides what parts are the real parts? Does Jesus actually really return? Or is it a symbolic return? I mean, Jehovah's Witnesses say it's a symbolic return, and he's been in uh, New York now since the early 1900s. So... We have to be careful that we don't symbolize the Bible away. So in a one-off sermon like this, I can't address it also. Let's just take a look real quick at what we're talking about with gaps. And, and what the, one of the most famous gaps that you've all heard about is Daniel. It's a confounding book, right? I mean, 70th week of, of Daniel, the 70 weeks prophecy we've all heard about. So other than... Uh, Generally, the Gentile times, the mystery of the church age, can anyone think of any prophecies from the Old Testament or New Testament that have to do with the end times at all or some big prophetic event that's supposed to happen? We know the return of Christ is supposed to be imminent, right? The next big thing that we're waiting for is the return of Christ. There, There aren't any big things that are coming down the pike like you read in the Old Testament about the dispersion of Israel and so so forth, and we had that. So put that in your hip pocket and think about that because we're going to talk about some of these gaps, and some of these gaps is where we get mixed because we say, well, there's a gap here, and there's a near and a far fulfillment. It appears to be like a foreshadowing, a near fulfillment, but then the ultimate completed fulfillment happens out in the future. So Daniel's 70 week prophecy, um, I've heard, I heard a guy say, you know, why would God flee out that 70th week way out into the future? That doesn't make any sense. So let's, let's take a look at that. First, let me run over real quick what some of these points are that we're going to try to make. And uh, you can listen for them and, and um, see if some of this sounds familiar. So we believe events given Daniel by the angel Gabriel are tied to the abomination of desolation or the man of sin known as the Antichrist um, and his evil desecration of the holy place, right? Gabriel told Daniel that the prophecy concerns Israel's entire future with some gaps. We understand that Gabriel gave Daniel a prophecy during Israel's first exile in captivity into Babylon, right? So this is the first time that Israel was taken out of the land, and they were in the middle of it. That the 70 weeks of years prophecy would begin with an edict that would mean the restoration of Jerusalem. We believe that the 69th weeks of years would see Messiah enter Jerusalem one last time before being cut off and then he's slain on the cross. We know that in Luke 1, Gabriel told Mary about Jesus' first coming and also how he would rule in a coming kingdom from David's throne. That's so far to date is a, you know, at least a 2,000-year gap, right? So there's a gap. Are we okay with that gap? Why would we not be okay with the 70th week of Daniel's gap if we're okay with Jesus came the first time, didn't accomplish all the things that he's going to accomplish, but he's coming back in the future, and he's going to rule in an earthly kingdom from David's throne. I would remind everybody that David's throne was never in heaven, so the kingdom of heaven doesn't really work from that standpoint either. We also believe Jesus himself affirmed in Luke 4 events Gabriel had told Mary, that he himself spoke of later, that he will only accomplish at his second coming. And he did this when he was in the synagogue and he enrolled the Isaiah scroll. We'll take a quick look at that passage um, in a bit. But there's a series of events where Jesus quit reading the passage, the scroll, when he was in the synagogue and rolled it up and tucked it away and people were confused because he stopped effectively in the middle of a sentence. So we'll take a look at that passage in Isaiah and see the things that Jesus did not read that they were expecting for the Messiah. We further believe that this 70th week prophecy is played out most prominently in the book of Revelation, literally. We further assert that this gap 
between the 69th and 70th week is, is now, and that those 70 weeks advance all these things, as Jesus said, they all tie together in an ultimate fulfillment and consummation upon Christ's second coming as depicted famously in Revelation chapter 19. Yeah, so far we've, we've got a couple of 2,000 year gaps. Okay? So, now I've told you where we've had it. Let's, if you have your Bibles, you should take a look at this one. This is one you might want to turn to, Daniel 9.27, Daniel 9, if you're not familiar with it. This is, um, there's so much to go into here, and we cannot. And we're just going to take a look at this one thing for the sake of context, the timing of events, and that's what we're here to look at this morning, is the timing of, of all these things. Because we want to know that there is hope that Christ is coming for his church, the bridegroom's coming for his bride, and that. There is much to go on before we get to that point. We will see trials and tribulations in this world, but not the tribulation Jesus spoke of in his Olivet Discourse. So in the Daniel 9.27, then he shall confirm, this is Gabriel speaking to Daniel again, and he's giving him a list of this prophecy, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, covenant, a contract, a peace agreement, what is a week? A week we know in, in the Western world is seven days. But a week is a Hebraism also for a set of sevens. Like we say a dozen, right? A dozen means 12. Give me a dozen eggs. Give me a dozen donuts. Do I get an amen? And so a week is a seven. So it can be a, a seven days. It can be seven months. It could be seven years. So he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, so this begins the great tribulation, as we will see in Matthew 24, but in the middle of the week, three and a half years in, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. So what does that imply? That implies that when this stuff happens, there's got to be a temple. Now you hear people sometimes get excited about, oh, they're planning on building a temple in Israel, and it is exciting, but it's exciting for this reason. Not that we need sacrifices, or that it's even the right thing to do, or that God wants them. But what it means is, is you can kind of stick a pin in, uh, you know, kind of a shelf life. We're getting to where that temple is supposed to be three and a half years in, um, and before it can be desecrated. And offerings are, are stopped. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate. Um, Let's stick a finger here and get ready to turn to Matthew 24 because that'll be the next place we'll look. Even until the consummation, which is determined, so the end, the end is set in stone, is poured out on the desolate. Events at the very end of Re Revelation. So those things is obviously going to be the end. That's the case we want to make too. So this is interesting now about Daniel's 70th week and the 70 weeks um, prophecy. There appears to be two near fulfillments or foreshadows that happen. Yeah. Many hundreds of years later, historians saw a fulfillment in Antiochus Epiphanes in 167 BC. Of course, everybody has pointed to this and said, this is the fulfillment, what Gabriel talked about. So Babylon revered Antiochus as Soter. Or liberator or savior. You've heard soteriology, that's the study of the doctrine of salvation. So soter means savior. So they called him savior. He took Jerusalem, he erected a stone, a statue of Zeus in the temple, and he slaughtered pigs on the altar. Sacrifices were made at the foot of an image of Antiochus. Yet, if you're there in Matthew 24, just to look at the context, look at verse 15. Jesus so far has been giving uh, the disciples, his disciples, these four disciples, answering their questions and giving them a bunch of signs, a bunch of things that were going to happen. So they were supposed to watch for these things. Verse 15 says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. So this is interesting because this is yet another 200 years later after Antiochus, and Jesus says, hey, when you see this, 
So wait, it hadn't happened yet? So that's kind of interesting, right? So we thought Antiochus was it. Everybody thought Antiochus was the guy. He did it. But it was a type. It was a type of what's going to happen in the future. Okay, how far in the future? So that's interesting. So it was yet future. So in the of it, just of course, Jesus now elaborates on the prophecy, and like Antiochus, the sort of foreshadowing does indeed happen a few short years later when Jerusalem is sacked in 70 AD. Now, a lot of people say, no, that wasn't a type, that was it. That was the fulfillment of it. Um, a long story about that, and it's an interesting story that we, again, can't get into tonight, but under Nero, Rome had taken, he'd laid siege to Jerusalem, was surrounding it with his armies. Word came, oh, the emperor is deathly ill. Um, everything was put on pause for a season. And according to Josephus, a first century historian, the name that most of us are probably familiar with, the number of Jews who died during the siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD was 1.1 million people. Ultimately, the pause button got taken off and um, I got surrounded and they laid siege and people started starving inside and it was just quite an ordeal. Again, that we don't have time to go into, but so again, that's by implication, that is, for this to be fulfilled, there's got to be a temple in place, and that was the place. It did happen in 70 AD. Did all those things happen? Well, we'll better look at the passage a little bit more clearly. You tell me if those things happened in 70 AD, but we'll get there. So not only does Paul elaborate more on the fulfillment of the abomination of desolation in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, passage you should get really familiar with it talks about antichrist it talks about the man of sin and it talks about him standing in the holy place and declaring himself god did that happen in 70 ad nobody seems to have nobody wrote down that yeah i saw it happen because they were burning the temple down so that would have been a pretty much a clay oven to stand in and declare yourself god yes this is my burning home it didn't happen Okay, but John in Revelation 13 and 14, where we also get the image of the beast, the mark of the beast, all the events around that all happen in Revelation 13 and 14. Now, here's, the, here's part of the problem. This is a good 20 years after 70 AD when Jerusalem was sacked. Most historians will say this. One good way to know that it's future events after 70 AD, because it was written, John wrote it in the 90s. One way we know is that Jesus mentions a martyr in one of his letters. The seven letters he wrote, he, he by dictation wrote, had John write down um, to the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation. And one of them he mentions as a martyr who was killed by Domitian in the 80s AD. So Revelation is still the future stuff that happens. And again, you got all these events and half the world being destroyed. That stuff didn't happen in 70 AD. Okay, so then, if you're in Matthew still, and I hope I haven't lost anybody yet, Matthew 24, 21, Jesus famously tells his disciples, for then... There will be great tribulation at that time. There will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, nor ever shall be. So that's a problem, too, with trying to say that these things happened in 70 AD. Jesus is saying, hey, this great tribulation, when these events happen and you have the abomination of desolation, this dude standing in the temple... There will, it'll be so bad, there will never up to this time have been anything so bad. And there will never be anything so bad afterwards. 70 AD, you got a problem. It only happened in Jerusalem. 1.1 million Jews being killed is bad. But does that exceed the events of World War I and World War II? How many Jews were killed then? So now that brings us up to today and going, well, we're, no, World War I and World War II as it is. So we got, we're still looking for these events to happen yet in our own future. Make sense? So it's our future. It's yet to happen. I want you to look down a little bit further because he's going to elaborate on this in verse 29. I told you we're not going to go through the whole chapter. Verse 29. 
As we read, ask yourself if any of these things happened in 70 AD. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light. Well, maybe. I don't know. Maybe it happened and people didn't write it down. The stars will fall from heaven, a lot of big meteor shower, a lot of asteroids and whatever else, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the Son of the Man, the Son of Man will appear in heaven. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and glory, and he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Did that happen in 70 AD? You got to really stretch and bend and symbolize away a bunch of stuff to try to say, yeah, that happened, symbolically. So I, I don't mean to be unkind and mocking of those who teach that, but you know, we need to stay into the scripture and we need to be consistent in, in the way we exercise our hermeneutic, study the scripture, translate scripture, exegete scripture to understand it. So while some want to scorn a far-flung fulfillment after a 2,000 year gap or okay with a gap here, in, um, they're not okay with a gap here in, in Matthew 24, about 70 AD in the second coming, other than um, you know, the kinds of things where Jesus comes back, returns again, that stuff they're okay with, but not that 69 to 70 week thing. Because that means that it hasn't happened yet, and that means that the stuff in Revelation has to be literal. So Jesus further confirmed these events as future and global in Revelation 3.10 as wrath. Now you can turn there if you want. It's a great passage in Revelation 3.10. In Revelation 3.10, this, within the context of his letters to the churches, he's written to the church at Philadelphia, and he's talking about wrath, what wrath looks like, because um, there's a difference between living under judgment, living in judgment, and the ultimate wrath of God, the ultimate judgment that's going to come upon the earth. Um, Israel, arguably, they're in judgment right now. They're, um, the Lord has blinded their eyes for a season, as Paul said in Romans 11. We're in judgment right now. Where we're at, the world is cursed, right? But this isn't the wrath of God. So the Old Testament refers to, in different ways, the day of the Lord, the day of the vengeance of our God, that day, a time, an hour. So it's, these aren't literal, it's a season, it's an age. The time of Jacob's or Israel's trouble. Jesus said in his Olivet Discourse, that'll be the greatest tribulation in earth's history. The letter of the Church of Philadelphia, if we look back, starting at verse 7. And to the angel of the Church of Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength. Man, I wish I could dig into this more. But kept my word and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they're Jews but aren't. Kind of like the Hebrew roots group, right? They say they're Jews, but they're not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet. And to know that I have loved you, because... You have kept my command to persevere. Because you have kept my man to, command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial. So he's speaking of a specific one, the hour of trial, which shall come where? Upon the whole world, not just Jerusalem. So it's global, it's worldwide. To test who? To test those who dwell on the earth. Do we dwell on the earth right now? We do. We're dwelling on the earth. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall go out no more. I shall write on him the name of God and the name of the city and, and uh, of God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven 
and my God, and I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So look at verse 10. So because you have kept my command to persevere, I will keep you from the hour of trial which is coming upon the earth, upon the whole world. So it's coming upon the whole world, and he's going to keep us out of it. It's going to cover the whole earth. Anybody who dwells on the earth, it's coming there, but I'm going to keep you from it. So is he going to like build us a big space shuttle? Some people say there's no rapture. Because the word rapture is not in the Bible. The word Bible is not in the Bible. The word Trinity is not in the Bible, but there you have it. The word harpazo is in the Bible. It's in the famous passage that we speak of about being caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. We can take a look at that. But okay, so he's going to keep us out. He's gonna, there is... In the Greek, it is terio ek. So he's going to keep us out of this big trial, this big tribulation that comes upon the earth. There are other, other terms. There's aerial ek. I'm going to take you out of it. Like you're in there, and I'm going to take you out of it. There is aerial apo. I'm going to take you from it. Like here comes a bus. Whoa, out of the way. Terio in, there's, which means I'm going to keep you in it. Terio dia, I'm going to keep you through it, kind of like Noah and his family on the ark. But none of that is it. This is Terio ek. I'm going to keep you out of it entirely. It's a great rapture passage. How does he do that? Again, the space shuttle or the rapture? You decide. So let, let's take a look at the wind, though, as we take a look at this. Um, given what we know that Israel was once in exile, slaves of Babylon before God, restored them 70 years later, as in other books record this. We also know that a predicted second dispersion um, took place in 70 AD, as predicted, in places like Jeremiah 9, 16. This is one of those verses you don't have to turn to, but you can make a note if you wish or play the recording back later. I will scatter them among the Gentiles whom neither they nor their fathers have known and I will send a sword after them until I have consumed them. Um, this is also recorded in places like, uh, if you're taking notes, um, there's Jeremiah thirteen twenty four, a few passages in Ezekiel like Ezekiel 5, 10, 12, 15, 20, 23, 22, 15, and Zechariah 10, 9. Be the Berean. Be like the Bereans, as Paul encouraged um, and praised. Don't take my word for it. Look it up. Both Jesus and Paul likened the, the end to being like birth pangs. Find a woman. First, first a woman will have a, a false labor, right? Sometimes it'll be a putsy putsy labor when she's pregnant. And then um, it'll build and build. And then finally, you know, this is the body getting ready for the actual labor, the real deal. And then finally labor starts and it builds. They're far apart at first. They get, start to get closer and closer as they build in intensity. So I'm told, thankfully, don't have to experience that. So likewise here, we have nothing historically or prophetic, until the 20th century. So before 1948, we were prophetically pregnant with possibilities, but then 1948, what happened? 1948, you can see this from here. 1940, you got 70 AD, you got all this stuff here with Israel, concerning Israel, because Israel is the key. Nothing until 1948. 1948, I guess you could say the water broke. What happened in 1948? Israel didn't exist anymore until 1948. The 1948 sympathy from the world, UN grudgingly, especially from their neighbors, decided they're going to give them their little plot of land, and Israel became Israel again. Not all of what it is now, but they became a nation once again. So it's fascinating. This didn't happen. There's a gap. 70 AD. To 1948, 20th century. <clears throat> so none of that, but we can know how long it stretched then to the second coming from Scripture, can't we? There are some hints that we can get. 
Not to the day. Look down verse 32. Some people, like in the recording, might be rolling their eyes, going, oh, here we go. Because a lot of people don't believe this. But it's the famous parable from the fig tree. But Jesus gave this for a reason. What's the context here? The end. He talked about the, the end again over a dozen times. That's the context. Verse 32. Now learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know the summer's near. So that wasn't even the whole point of the parable of the fig tree. Here's where the, the point is that he makes. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it's near even at the doors. All what things? All the stuff he's been talking about up to this point. A lot of signs, right? Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Now, here's where some of the big debate happens, okay? So let's take a look at this. Let's be fair with it. First of all, the, the, the two things people get hung up on here. One is people get hung up on a fig tree. Don't get hung from a fig tree. but get hung up on a fig tree. And the other is the phrase, this generation, what that means. So the fig tree is going to pop out at you over a handful of verses we're going to read as we, as we, um, told we get ready to close here. But suffice to say, the fig tree has been used many times as emblematic of Israel in the scripture, including by Jesus. Um, Luke records all the trees, and the reason why Luke records when you see the fig tree and all the trees is because it was very popular. It was commonplace for nations to be associated with one kind of a tree or another. Very common. So these, uh, they were demarked as emblematic for them. So Jesus refers the fig tree to and all the trees as he draws from numerous times from the book of Joel in the Olivet Discourse. So Joel is a key book to read and understand if you want to understand Matthew 24 because Jesus is seriously drawing heavily from it. So I'd encourage that. Um, we got Joel 1, we read about trees, we read about the tribulation in Joel 1, the day of the Lord in chapter 2, coming like a thief, the restoration of his people, the kingdom. Um, we read about Armageddon in chapter 3. We also read about the sheep and the goats, like in Matthew 25. That's from Joel. And in case you missed that, what I said before, Matthew 25 is the continuation of the Olivet Discourse. It's not just chapter 24, so you've got to keep reading. So many will argue that this generation, um, that it's used to denote a class of people. And it can be, from the way the term is used um, from the Greek. But this is a rule. Uh, it can refer to a grouping by race um, or, and without regard to a particular time, such as you generation of vipers. So it's a generation of vipers. So not even necessarily with regard to time at all. It's just a particular people. It can refer to a time frame, obviously. But in every, every case, it's like real estate. Context, context, context. So we have to use, we can use some process of elimination. And logic is a proper good hermeneutic, right? Because God is not illogical. So that you can use process of elimination. So many will contend that this generation only refers to the Jews. The reason being that Matthew is a book they maintain that is written for Jews to Jews by Jews. So you can pretty much apply that rule to the whole Bible. If you're not careful. So the whole Bible, none of it's about us then. None of it applies to us. And it doesn't apply today. Pretty much the whole Bible is written by Jews, for Jews, and so forth. The only thing, but it would be unique if that was the case because Matthew is the one book, the one gospel where Jesus mentions church. Matthew 16, church. So that doesn't quite square. The word generation is from the Koine Greek, genea, and it means a generation by implication in age, the period, or the persons. Age, generation, nation, or time. So you've got to use context. While some will try to nail down a certain number of years, to determine the length of a generation, 40 years, 70 years, 90 years, and they all have Bible passages, <clears throat> Psalms, and so forth, that will tell you this is how long it is. We have the days of Noah. Jesus mentioned the days of Noah. And Noah, Methuselah, whose very name means roughly when he's gone, it comes. 
He lived a little longer. He lived longer than any man who had ever lived before or since. So in that case, a generation is last man standing. So Methuselah was the last man standing. So generation doesn't have to be 40 years or 60. It could be the last man standing as Methuselah. And Jesus did say it would be as in the days of Noah. So what then is this context that we should bring to bear about how to understand it? The context is found, if you're in Matthew 24, to look back at verse 3. The disciples asked Jesus, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus is answering their questions, and he's answering them in that order. Jesus mentions the end a dozen times along with his coming in the context. So that's the context. Giving all these things. What will be the signs? And he gives them things to know about the end. So after an elaborate list of things, Jesus answering their questions, verse 34 says, this generation, what generation? Whatever generation it is, it will be a generation that will not pass away till all these things, what? Take place. They happen. They're fulfilled. Therefore, he's speaking of a generation around at the time of these tribulation things and the second coming take place. So can Jesus be talking about the Jews as this generation? Look again at your wording. Look at your wording carefully. Until all these things take place. Until. That word until is interesting. That means two things. One, whenever these things take place, that generation will not pass away. Therefore, two, it's not the Jews. Are the Jews going to pass away? The Jews will not pass away. Therefore, he's referring to the generation, a generation, singular, not generations, that's alive to see all these things take place. The language is about the things, and the generation that sees the things. And not just the tail end, but all these things that he's been describing. So look at it about fig trees. If uh, You could write down if you want. You don't have to go there. Joel chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, about fig trees. For a nation has come up against my land, powerful and beyond number. Its teeth are lion's teeth, and it has the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste to my vine and has splintered my fig tree. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it down. Their branches are made of white. So Israel will be trampled underfoot by Gentiles. God would again be honored by them during the Great Tribulation. It's concurrent with Israel's discipline and God's judging the nations. God will restore the people and the land Israel uh, back to their promised borders, serving him forever and ever while Messiah reigns from David's throne. So from the fig tree... Learn its lesson. As soon as the branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know the summer is near. So also when you see all these things, know that he is near. Even at the gates, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away till all these things take place. So the prophecies of the Old Testament begin with Israel regathered into a desert land, dry and desolate, from all the nations. And we're going to look at some verses about that. That's a condition that existed in 1948. It was a desert land. No longer. 1948 must be the beginning, the beginning of these prophecies because no longer can Israel come back to a wasteland because that's part of the prophecy. The conditions of them coming back in is that when they do come back, it's going to be a wasteland. Who thinks that Israel will ever become a wasteland again? 1948 must be the beginning of a restoration, for there's no way back. Nothing says they ever leave again. Quite the contrary, it says they will never again be uprooted. There is no way for the land to become a desert and for them to be scattered again. Can this be a repeat? What does the Bible actually say about it? Because we want to stay biblical, right? And I want you to be Bereans and ask yourselves, well, can it? Is it possible? Well, one passage is Isaiah 11.11. Isaiah 11 says, It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time. It's not a third time mentioned in prophecy, not a fourth time. mentions the second time. 
to recover the remnant of his people who are left. Down in verse 12, he says, He will set up a banner for the nations, and he will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So they weren't just away in Babylon, so we know for sure that this passage is talking about this last dispersion to the nations. So we have a regathering. We also have wrath before the restoration of Israel. But again, Jesus, it covers this though. And Jesus, when I mentioned to you before in, in Luke chapter 4, Jesus talking about, you know, reading from the scroll from Isaiah 61. Let's take a quick look at that. In Luke chapter 4, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Jesus reading the scroll here. Because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolls it up and he tells them that today this is being fulfilled in your midst. And they're going, what is, what is that about? Because in Isaiah 61, it continues and goes on. Um, and because verse 2 is to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus makes a full stop. And the vengeance of the day of vengeance of our God. What is the day of vengeance of our God? And it's the day of wrath. It's the tribulation period. That's one thing that happens. And then, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a, a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, so they may be called Oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. And that's all during the kingdom of the millennium period on the earth. So here we have near and far prophecy, 2,000 years roughly in between. We've got sandwich right in the middle of it, wrath. You have Jesus fulfilling it partially when he came the first advent, and then he will finish the rest when he returns on the earth. So how does this play out to the church? Oh, okay, Dave, great. What does this have to do with church? With me, great for real as well. Yay. <laughs> so we've already read about the escape, the great escape in Revelation 3.10. In 1 Thessalonians 1.10 also talks about how um, it says, We now serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. And then... Uh, Go over a couple more chapters to chapter 4. We who are alive and remain shall be caught up. Harpazo, that's the word we get rapture. We'll be raptured. Rapture is uh, you know, it's just the Latin term. It's a derivative of the Latin term from the Latin Bible. That's all that is. But we will be caught up. We will be raptured. Um, snatched up, taken up suddenly is what it means. Together, with them, where? In the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. And then what happens? And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Okay, consider yourselves comforted. We're going to be raptured. We're not here for the wrath. We might suffer persecution in this world. What if the world can bring? But when we go with the Lord, we're going to always be with him. In chapter 5, we read about the day of the Lord. Of chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians. The Lord comes as a thief and catches them off guard, is what it says. We are that precious pearl, the bride of Christ, salt and light, that is stolen from the earth. The Lord comes like a thief. He snatches us off, off the earth, and we're that which is stolen. We're salt and light. We're gone. We're that pearl, that precious thing to him that he takes off. It says in chapter 5 of uh, verse picking up in verse 3 says then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape but you brethren are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief is it becoming clear now on that side of the prophetic gap Israel is scattered not to Babylon this time but to the nations all the countries on this side of the prophetic gap the 70 weeks prophecy resumes. Israel's prophecy to Mary about Jesus resumes. Jesus' prophecy concerning about himself or about um, 
uh, from Isaiah, all these things written, this generation, these things take place. And Jesus also likened the end to like Noah. The world was living as usual, life as usual. They're marrying, giving in marriage, working, having barbecues, and then it began to rain. Jesus said, is, can it be as in the days of Noah? A lot of times we read as in the days of Noah and we think about the wickedness on the earth. Okay, so there's always been wickedness on the earth. But here's a distinction, right? They go on life as usual. And it began to rain. But Noah didn't know exactly when it was going to start to rain, but he probably had an inkling when God started leading the animals onto the ark. Signs, right? It was getting close when God began to walk the animals into the ark. And Ezekiel 36 and 37 the dry bones prophecy, it talks about a dry desert full of dry bones and God restores the land, the trees, and he fleshes out the people. So we know today because God is walking the animals onto the ark and it's about to rain. God is walking the Jews back into the land, into what was once a desert and now it's Israel again and it's about to rain. In Luke, he records that Jesus also gave the example of Lot as well as Noah. Abraham asked God repeatedly, you know the story, what the number of righteous present would be that would save the city from destruction. You know, God, will you save the city if there's 50 righteous? Well, don't get mad, God. Well, how about 40? Please don't, don't get angry with me. What, what about if there's 30 left? All the way down to this 10. For the sake of 10 righteous? And God said, I'll spare it if there's even 10. So, God will spare his wrath for the sake of even ten. Ultimately, in Genesis 19, when it was time for Lot's family to leave, what was Lot told? Verse 22. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Lot was considered righteous. Not by Lot's own doing, right? Not by his own righteousness. We know how Lot was. But Lot lived by faith. We live by faith. It's not our righteousness that saves us. We don't stand in our own righteousness. But that of Christ who has already borne the wrath of God on the cross on our behalf. No, we're not going to experience God's wrath. So is there biblically any wrath that takes place during the church age? I couldn't find anything. I searched high and low through the scriptures. But there is a time for Israel when they have to endure and see these things and go through these things. It's part of his judgment. So I'm going to read through some passages here. As we wrap up, I'm going to go through several passages here. So please be patient. It'll take a minute, but these are key, and you can write down the references, but just hang with me and just listen to these passages and what they're trying to say, okay? Amos 9, verses 11 to 15, about Israel being regathered. The restoration of Israel is the heading. In that day, I will raise up the booth of David that has fallen and repair its breaches and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. I will restore the fortunes of my people, Israel, and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine, and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them on their land, and they shall never again be re uprooted in the New King James. They shall never again be uprooted. So is Israel going to leave or get kicked out again or go into captivity again and go off somewhere else? No, once they're there, once they're back that second time, Isaiah eleven eleven, they're there. They're not going to be uprooted. So you see a shelf life to this end time things with this generation. And Jesus saying all these things are within that generation. He, when you're down, the generation that sees all these things will not pass before we see the conclusion of all these things. Ezekiel 30, verses 1 to 3. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, prophesy, thus says the Lord God, Wail, alas for the day, for the day is near. The day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of clouds, a time of doom for the nations. That's what the tribulation is about. It's doom for the nations, the wrath of God. It's a seven-year period of time, Daniel's 70th week. We will also see that day will include um, into the establishment of the kingdom. And, of course, we know what happens after that. 
So the day isn't necessarily a 24-hour day. It can be, but a day is an age. It's a period. Um, Jeremiah 30. Restoration for Israel. Look at that. Jeremiah 30, sometime when you get a chance. Verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, write in a book all the words that I have spoken to you. For behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people. Does that sound familiar with what we've already read? Israel and Judah, says the Lord, and I will bring them back to the land that I gave to their fathers. It's the same land. It's not something different. And they shall take possession of it. And then we get the tribulation here. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. It was Jacob. His name was changed to Israel. But he shall be saved out of it. Verse 8, and it shall come to pass that day, declares the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off your neck, and I will burst your bonds, and foreigners shall no more make a servant of him, and they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, speaking of Messiah Jesus, whom I will raise up for them. So we have restoration beginning, we got wrath, restoration. There's a couple of key words you should read in Ezekiel 36 and 37 about the dry bones prophecy. But in that, those chapters, we do have where uh, I'll multiply places for you, I will multiply the cities, the cities will be inhabited, man and beast inhabited for, to your former times. Um, verse 17, their ways before me were like uncleanness of a woman in minstrel and purity, so I poured out my wrath upon them for the Lord, uh, for the blood that they shed in the land and the idols that had defiled. I had scattered them to the nations. So his wrath was scattering them to the nations. And of course, chapter 37 is the dry bones prophecy. He's going to bring them back in and flush them out. Ezekiel 11, verse 15. Son of man, your brothers, even, even your brothers, your kinsmen, the whole house of Israel, all of them are those whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, go far from the Lord to us, this land given, to, given for possession. Therefore, say, thus says the Lord God, though I remove them off far off among the nations, and though I scattered them among the countries... Yet I have been a sanctuary to them for a while in the countries where they have gone. Therefore, say, thus says the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. Um, Hosea 9.10, like grapes in the wilderness, I found Israel. Like the first fruit of the fig tree. In all its season, I saw your fathers. A couple more quick ones, and we're done. Jeremiah 8. At that time, declares the Lord, the bones of the king of Judah, the bones of the officials, the bones of the priests, the bones of the prophets, and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be brought out of their tombs. You shall say to them, thus says the Lord, when men fail, do they not rise again? If one turns away, does he not return? And they refuse to return. When I would gather them, declares the Lord, there are no grapes on the vine, nor figs on the fig tree. Even the leaves are withered. And what I have I gave them have passed away from them. And then Jeremiah 9 goes on to continue with the diaspora and then the regathering where he says, if I can, verse 6, I will gather them from among the nations whom neither they nor their fathers have known, and I will send the sword after them, and I have consumed them. Jeremiah 25, he talks about the past. Jeremiah 24, I'm sorry. Verse 4, he says, And the word of the Lord came to me, thus says the Lord God, the God of Israel, like these good figs, so I will regard as good the exiles from Judah, whom I have sent away from this place to the land of the Chaldeans, I will set my eyes upon them for good, and I will bring them back into the land. That's the regathering. And then what happens next? I will build them up, not tear them down. I will plant them, not pluck them up. I will give them a heart to know that I am the Lord. That's going to happen by the middle of the tribulation. And we read that in Romans 11 as well. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. For they shall return to me with their whole heart. That's the repentance 
of the land of Israel. So these passages all point to this pattern. We see the gaps that Greg was talking about with prophecies, how they have a partial fulfillment and then a complete ultimate fulfillment. And the complete ultimate fulfillment of all these things, including the wrath, the day of the Lord, sees its ultimate fulfillment when Jesus actually comes down and puts his foot on the Mount of Olives. So this is our hope. And when we, this is our, this should humble us. It should, we should feel blessed by it and realize that our hope is in Christ, that there is such a thing as a, a rapture, being caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and we're going to miss the wrath of God upon the earth. And that we are in that generation because once the cat's out of the bag or once the genie's out of the bottle, I don't think of any types of sayings like this you want to think of. Once that's happened, it's, it's a done deal. He's not going to take them back up and he's not going to roll it all back. There's a shelf life here. Don't know how long a generation is, but at least until, as in the days of Noah, the last man standing. So endure to the end. Whatever persecution happens, be encouraged. Trust that the things that are going on in the world around you aren't going to come crashing in around your ears. And even if they did, it's by God's design, and you'll get through it, and he will bless you through it. And we're ultimately going to be with Christ, and we're going to rule and reign with him forever. Well, so will we'll always be with the Lord. Let's close in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for this, the mountain of scriptures in the Old Testament. So many I couldn't even approach today in just a one-off sermon that shows that you are faithful in your promises to Israel, even in all their wickedness and all their ways. It's a promise not a two-way contract that they could break. It's a promise, and you call it a promise repeatedly. And Paul said in Romans 11 that you're going to keep your promise with them. And then if we think you should fail that promise, we should be kind of maybe nervous and worried because that would mean you wouldn't keep your promise necessarily with us. No, you're faithful, Lord, in every way with all your people. We thank you for calling us to be among that number. To be joint heirs together with Jesus Christ through time and eternity. And even so, I want to say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen.